And thank you to the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. Can you all hear me okay? Just give me a shout if you cannot. So, um, great. Right, so, um, so my name is Daphne Kotza. I'm at UNC in Chapel Hill in the Department of Applied Physical Sciences. And what I would like to talk to you about today is this uh, project that I have been working on for a few years now, since, uh, mostly since I got here, which is uh, on, on active matter uh, in fluids and at intermediate Reynolds numbers. And so I will be uh, explaining um, all of these things and, and Oops. Okay, so first of all, just a, a picture of my group. I'm still excited that uh, people come to work with me. So I've had some new members due to COVID. We don't have a new group photo, but, um, but this is my group and my group website where you can the other projects that I am working on. Um, so first off, I would like to acknowledge that people have worked on this project I'll be talking about. So at the top are people who have been in my group. So Thomas Dombrowski, Hong Nguyen are currently in my group. Thomas is a grad student, Hong is a, is a postdoc that just arrived, and, and Shannon was a postdoc in my group. Uh, as well as collaborators, both at UNC, Boyce and, and Laura, some of you may know them, uh, and people outside of uh, UNC. As you can see here, as well as in the UK at the University of Nottingham, um, Mike, Roger, and, 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 and Rick. Okay, so my first, I would like to first start off, uh, you saw in my title that uh, I'm interested in active matter, and so I'm just gonna have a brief introduction. I imagine that most people in the audience today are, um, are familiar with active matter, but just as a reminder, this is a, this is a slide that shows a bunch of images that basically I think beautifully demonstrates some of the characteristics of active matter. So active matter is, is um, our uh, systems that are made of a large number of components. Uh, they could be organisms or, or synthetic particles, but they're made out of components that are self-powered uh, and, and motile. This is our sort of uh, standard definition of active matter. And uh, when we talk about active matter, we usually talk about the collective behavior of these systems. So it's not uh, on this single level. And as you can see in this, um, in this slide here, and some of the characteristics are that there are, it happens at many length scales, as I, I will point out. So here we have a school of fish, we have flocks of birds, we have bacteria, uh, as well as synthetic things like robots and, um, and traffic even. And so some of the characteristics are that active matter, we can see this kind of collective behavior across many length scales. You may also notice from these images that uh, active matter occurs in many different environments, uh, including in, in fluids a lot of the time, where fluids, uh, the fluid, the surrounding fluid really plays a role. And of course, I, I, people here are, are, are quite interested in, in, in fluid dynamics. Um, and, and I will be talking about this uh, as well. And also something that's very interesting for me as a, as a physicist is that we see the same behavior from different kinds of interactions. This, is, this can be a, a trap sometimes. We tend to think that because we have figured out one pattern, it's, it's, it's the same kind of interaction in, in every pattern at all scales, and that's not true. But, um, but, it, but it's interesting to, to, to remember this. Okay, so I, as, as I said, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in fluids and, uh, and active matter in fluids. So um, in, this, in, this, uh, in this community, there's a, there's a way to look at um, biological and artificial swimmers in fluids and, and have this plot where what I'm showing here is the traveling speed as a function of the Reynolds number. And what you see are all sorts of uh, organisms. I'm not showing artificial swimmers in this plot. All sorts of organisms that uh, and, and the uh, corresponding Reynolds numbers and, and, and speeds. And the Reynolds number in these systems is defined as the characteristic speed of the organism times its length scale, its size, divided by the viscosity of the surrounding fluid. And as you will notice, um, at low Reynolds numbers, we have uh, the, the, the viscosity effects dominate, and here we have a Stokes regime. So this is where microorganisms, bacteria, cells uh, operate in, in terms of biological systems, but we also have nanoparticles, colloids, um, in terms of synthetic systems that operate at, at low Reynolds numbers. Um, we also have this other regime here where we call it high Reynolds numbers. So here, inertial effects dominate, and we can make assumptions about uh, negligible viscosity. 
And here we have birds and whales and ships and airplanes as well as humans that operate at high Reynolds numbers. But what I would like to point out is that we also have this intermediate Reynolds regime where uh, we have to take into account the influence of both components, both viscosity uh, and inertia. And this is not a region of space that in biology is uh, empty of organisms. And it's not a region of space where we, where in terms of engineering, we are not, we would not be interested in having machines or processes that operate in these intermediate rental numbers. <clears throat> so some examples that I'm showing here. So for one thing, you'll notice that there are at least three orders of magnitude um, in the Reynolds number where we call this roughly intermediate Reynolds uh, regime. I'm showing here a bunch of organisms that are known to operate in, these, in, this, uh, in this region. Uh, but basically anything that's roughly, this is rough because really one should but roughly these are the length scales where the uh, Reynolds, uh, intermediate Reynolds number could be uh, relevant. But some examples are ciliates, plankton, insects, small animals or sorts of small animals that fly or, or swim, as well as small robots uh, or drones uh, that one would like to, to design. Now, I am particularly interested in these two regions. And in fact, uh, at, I'm interested in what happens in the intermediate Reynolds range, as well as uh, where that actually happens. In other words, um, what happens at the boundary? So one thing that's also interesting about this uh, region in space is that the boundaries are not very clear, but can be very important for biology and for materials as hopefully I will, I will show, um, will be clear in the rest of the talk. So what happens at this boundary? So if you have, so for one thing, one thing that's very interesting to point out is that pretty much all the organisms that end up in this intermediate regime, um, in this intermediate region, were born uh, in the Stokes regime and grew in size. So there are a few, but very interesting papers that talk about transitions between uh, of real organisms and the physiological transitions that take place. Because for example, they have to change the way they swim, but you can imagine that they have to change all kinds of behaviors like the way they feed. If, if they're organisms that operate in, in a fluid, everything that they do is gonna be governed by, uh, by, the, by, the, by the fluid dynamics. So, uh, so this, uh, where this boundary is, for different kinds of swimmers, for different kinds of, um, of uh, swimming modes uh, could, be, could be very interesting and, and could have a uh, great impact in, in, in understanding the biology. But also on a, on a fundamental level, I think it's, it's very interesting. So I'm gonna point out why a bit more, a few more reasons why I think this regime is really interesting for active matter and it's all, summarizing this perspective I have in, in soft matter. Um, and these, these are all ideas and, and some of this um, I will talk about in the rest of my talk with, with the actual research. But this is sort of a, an idea slide. So why is this regime interesting? This is a motivation. So, so one was this question about what happens at the boundary. And one thing that for example, an example of this is that we would get transitions in behavior. An example of this would be, you know, you can go from immotile to motile, right? So, so you could have something that doesn't swim in, in the Stokes regime, but starts to swim in the intermediate uh, Reynolds um, range because of uh, the influence of inertia. So we would expect transitions in behavior and there could be other things that, that go on. The other question that I find really interesting is what happens for many swimmers. And here the, the, the question is, is twofold because on either side of the boundary, because this is true on either side of the boundary, and I will explain what I mean. So for one thing, if we're looking at the intermediate, uh, in the intermediate range, another thing that I would like to point out, and if you have worked in this region, you would know, is that we already within this intermediate range, we get different behavior at different Reynolds numbers. So what happens at Reynolds number one is not necessarily what happens at 10, is not necessarily what happens at 100 or 500. The reason is because this range is not, at least my understanding is that it doesn't have um, characteristics 
in the same way that the, the, the actual two limits have, the low and the high Reynolds uh, numbered limits, where we can sort of neglect viscosity or we can neglect inertia. So when we can't make these assumptions, everything else is bucketed in this uh, intermediate range. So there's no, my understanding is that there's no characteristic behavior or universal understanding, especially for, for organisms in, in this region. So there's a lot of wealth of behavior, even for a single, uh, even for a single swimmer, but uh, even more so when we're looking at the collective behavior of these swimmers. And the other thing is to thinking about swarms of microscopic swimmers. So if we imagine that we are not deep in, 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 in the Stokes regime, uh, but maybe close to this boundary, but still in, in, in the Stokes regime for the individual swimmer, the question, a question that may arise, and I'm not the first one to, to bring this up, but a question that may arise is, is the, the relevant length scale the, the, of the single swimmer uh, which we use to calculate the Reynolds number usually is less scale when you have millions of microscopic swimmers. There's very interesting work, obviously, in some of the people that are, I think are usually in, in the audience here who have worked on these scale tur turbulence of bacteria and, and things like that. Um, and another point I would like to make is, is to think about um, active inertial suspensions as materials. So again, going back to all this work, beautiful work that has been done in active matter of uh, bacterial suspensions, uh, it would be really interesting to see what happens when we cross that boundary or when we are close to that boundary. Is there a way to push it from one to the other? Obviously, I'm a physicist. I remember talking to colleagues about this and I said, can't you change the viscosity of the fluid? And they said, you know, the bacteria die or, you know, things happen. So, uh, so, but this is a sort of um, theoretical question, uh, but it, it, would be, it would be interesting to think about other uh, organisms perhaps as, as a, an active inertial suspension. And, and the final thing uh, as, that I would like to, the final point I would like to make is uh, if you are more in the physics or soft matter, soft matter community, uh, we, we talk a lot about hierarchical self-assembly uh, in biology, but also in, in, in synthetic materials. And that this is one of the things that uh, we try to do, people try to do to mimic the biological systems and the, the complexity of biological systems. And so this is a, an image from this review by Nibelman Dojic, where they basically just so, show this hierarchical nature of, of living organisms. The reason why I'm bringing this up here is because when we talk about self-assembly and as self-assembling components get larger in size, uh, depending on obviously exactly the system that we're looking at, it may be relevant to think about inertia as these systems get bigger and bigger um, in size. Okay, so with this, I'm, I'm gonna, go into my, uh, into more sort of actual uh, results and, and research. And so the first thing that we wanted to, to look at was what happens at this boundary. Um, and in particular, we thought we could design a swimmer whose behavior changes as we cross the boundary. So this was the first question. Uh, and we're gonna look at the case of a single swimmer to begin with to understand that first. And so the, the simplest model we could think of was, was, is a reciprocal model swimmer. So that is made uh, out of two spheres connected by this ring that oscillate in time, as you can see here. And this is a reciprocal swimmer, which means that it does not swim in Stokes flow. But because of the asymmetry in the two spheres, it should start swimming um, at some point because of inertia. And this is the experimental implementation of this system. So we, so, so this is a light plastic um, bead sphere that wants to float. This is a heavier glass uh, bead that wants to sink. And they're connected by this sort of spring wire. Um, this makes the whole object neutrally buoyant. This is roughly the size. And we put this in a container filled with fluid and it was pretty hard to find a way to, to figure out a way to power uh, this dumbbell um, externally. So what we did was that we shook the cell and, and then this, um, this object responds to this 
uh, oscillation. This is what the experimental setup looks like, and I'm just going to show you a video so that you see what I'm talking about. So you uh, so you shake the external the the container, and then both spheres respond to that driving oscillation because everybody has different essentially different densities. So the the two spheres have different densities to each other and to the fluid. So you get this relative motion between uh, the two spheres. So we did this for uh, a number of frequencies and some amplitudes and some um, viscosities. And this is what the swimmer looks like. So it, when it translates. And here I'm showing some of the data that we got from, from this experiment and the simulations, which I haven't discussed the method here, but I, I'd be happy to talk about before. So what I'm showing here is the velocity of the swimmer, of the swimmer, um, as a function of this Reynolds number that we call, that is called the streaming Reynolds number. So this is the amplitude of the oscillation. They're, they're actually the relative amplitude between the two spheres. So the um, for the experiment and the simulations. And what I'm showing here, right, is the plot. And what, it, what is happening is that it looks like the, the swimmer um, has no velocity below a certain Reynolds number, and then above it, it starts to swim. And it, this looks like it's zero, and then there's an onset where uh, the, the object starts swimming. This is just a zoom in of a typical trajectory. The plus signs our simulations, the rest of it is experiments. So you can see that we have this nice agreement. Um, so this is, this is quite interesting. We see that the critical onset happens around between like 20 and 40 uh, in this case. And I, I'm, I'm gonna show you a couple of videos. I, I hope you can see them. So this is what happens below the, this onset, this critical onset. If you focus here, you'll see that it's vibrating, but it's not actually going anywhere. Um, whereas, at, if you're above the critical, this critical Reynolds number, you can see that the, the dumbbell is vibrating and it's also um, moving uh, up, swimming. So we want to understand what, what this is, and I call this a new propulsion mechanism. I will get back to this. What we wanted to, to understand is whether there's a, whether we can see signatures or differences in the, in the fluid between the stationary and the swimming dumbbell. And this was our attempt to do this. These crosses are, um, these egg signs are um, the, um, the, the, the vort vortices. Uh, and, and we saw some differences, but I'm gonna get back to this because it's, it's, it's gonna, I'm, I'm gonna have some um, newer and better plots of the, of the fluid flow in, in these systems. But the point I would like to make is that uh, there's no vortex shedding. Uh, we don't see any vortex shedding in, these, in this system. And, um, and again, we see this thing that we see different behavior as, as the Reynolds number increases. So we have uh, below a certain Reynolds number, we see uh, a pump, we see vibration in place, but it doesn't go anywhere. Above a certain Reynolds number, the, the swimmer starts to swim. And this is just, I, I, mean, I think the, the people in the audience know this very well, but um, if you change the geometry, you can see vortex shedding at very similar Reynolds numbers, right? This is just an example, but there are many examples of flapping wings, uh, shedding vortices, at intermediate Reynolds numbers. This is an example from, from Laura's, Laura's group. Okay, so this, is, this was sort of our, our first attempt to do this, but, um, in the beginning, I motivated this talking about uh, organisms and active matter. And one of the characteristics is that the active particle is self-propelled. Um, so what about self-propulsion? Because what I, what I talked about here was that <clears throat> in this experiment, we uh, vibrated the external, the, the container. Um, <clears throat> so what about self-propulsion? So now we're looking at only uh, simulations and theory of this internally vibrated swimmer. And, and this is what it looks like. And we have this Reynolds number defined here. If you're confused about this, I will be talking more about it. But basically, this is the Reynolds number based on um, the small sphere uh, amplitude. Uh, omega is the vibrational frequency. Uh, R is the small spheres radius and use the uh, 
uh, viscosity of the fluid. And this is roughly the range that we're looking at. So we're using uh, IBMR, which is an immersed boundary method uh, with uh, adaptive mesh refinement. This was developed by Boyce Griffith. And we got a lot of help from Amnit as well, who used to be Boyce's postdoc and is now at San Diego State faculty there. And this is just an image of how this uh, computational code works, like the, the adaptive uh, mesh that makes it um, um, easier to run uh, expensive simulations that makes it much faster. Okay, so I'm just gonna cut straight to the to the point and show you a video where we we see this different behavior at uh, low and both are intermediate, so Reynolds 5 and Reynolds 150. And this is the same swimmer um, in two different viscosities essentially. So what you'll notice right away, and, and what we're showing is the vert vorticity. This swimmer moves down and this swimmer moves up. If you focus a little bit on the, um, on the fluid dynamics, on, the, on the, what the fluid is doing, you'll see that uh, it looks a little different. They, they look different. So we thought that was very surprising and very interesting. And so we looked at this, very simple swimmer for a range of Reynolds numbers and we saw the following. So at zero Reynolds, so this is in Stokes flow, we see no swimming, which is a good check because it shouldn't swim. Then as soon as, uh, as soon as we're not at zero Reynolds, so for the lowest Reynolds number that we studied, that was 10 to the minus four, um, we see the swimmer moving down. So with the small sphere in the front, um, and its speed increases until it starts to slow down as you increase the Reynolds number. And then at some point, it's like in this, uh, it undergoes this transition uh, beyond which we have a, uh, the swimmer switches direction and it moves with a large sphere on the front. And it keeps doing that up to where we have studied and we have gone a little further. Uh, in terms of the Reynolds number. So with very simple, with this very, very simple, um, geometrically simple swimmer, basically an oscillating dumbbell, an asymmetric oscillating dumbbell, we have this already, this uh, wealth of behavior that was very um, sort of counterintuitive for us to begin with. Um, so we did this for a range of parameters, and this is all in our paper shown at the bottom here. Where, um, where we did this for a range of parameters and what we tried to do was to collapse this transition to understand what determines this transition between uh, the two modes of uh, the two resulting swimming modes. And what we found was that in order to, to collapse this transition, we had to plot, uh, to plot, to use the Reynolds number that is the, the Reynolds number of the small sphere. So this is why uh, we, I have been talking in terms of, of that Reynolds number. So this is the amplitude of the, of the small sphere, uh, and this is the radius of the small sphere. This omega is the uh, frequency of the oscillation. So this was very interesting. So it, this indicates that the transition is dominated by the small sphere. Um, obviously, we don't have an analytical explanation or solution to this, even though our collaborators, I'm gonna, um, Nick Derr and Chris Rycroft at Harvard are working on this and making great progress. But, um, so, but so far, what I'm showing you here is, is not, um, we don't fully, we don't understand exactly why, but the data indicates that tra the transition is dominated by the small sphere. But the question is, what is the fluid doing? Um, so, can we understand that? So what I'm showing you here is the time average vorticity field um, for the, the first part, so the small sphere leading regime, uh, we call it. So the swimmer was moving down. Um, and what you'll notice is that, so the swimmer is moving down. So what you'll see is that this is, so this is the time average vorticity field over, over cycle. And you can see the arrows are the velocities. Um, so we see that the fluid is moving out and in, in the direction of the, of swimming. 
but if we look at the large sphere leading uh, case, it's actually doing the opposite. So the so here uh, the swimmer is, is swimming up, and uh, but along the line of swimming, you can see that the flow is away from the swimmer and goes in to the side. And it's actually more complicated, but we can roughly summarize it like this. But certainly the time average vorticity field, the field switches direction uh, when we go from one regime to the other. And I couldn't help but notice that this reminds, re reminded us of uh, pullers and pushers in Stokes flow. Uh, of course, we're not in Stokes flow here and we are not making any assumptions about the field. This is the resulting average field that we see around, uh, around the dumbbells. Uh, but nonetheless, it is very reminiscent qualitatively of a puller in this case. Uh, remember that this our swimmer is moving down, is pulling fluid in. Um, and the pusher in this case, where it's here and, and moving up. So the question still remains, why does the flow change? Right, okay, so, so we've seen, we see that the flow changes and that's interesting, but why does that happen? And why does the swimmer switch direction? Um, and so to answer this question, one has to go back to an, and understand what happens for the single oscillating sphere, okay? So I'm gonna be talking about this effect of steady streaming that um, has been known for a long time, um, but the, the, the more specifics uh, that relate to our system uh, where was worked on by, by, by Riley. So this is the, the, the paper that I'll be sort of talking about a little bit. So this is on a sphere oscillating in a viscous fluid. Um, and I will explain uh, what this paper suggests. So, um, so, so to, understand, to understand our dumbbell, first we have to understand what happens for a single sphere oscillating in a fluid at intermediate Reynolds numbers. And what Riley says is that what happens is that we get this non-zero time average flow. Uh, this is the result of the fact that the, this, the fluid is, uh, you can't ignore the, non, the, the, iner the inertial nonlinear terms. And this is called steady streaming. And so I'm gonna take you through how I understand steady streaming and, and also what Riley says. So if we look at the oscillation of a single sphere and we, um, go through the cycle. So let's say that this sphere is moving up um, and it creates some vorticity uh, around it. Uh, in the second half of the cycle, the sphere is moving down and it creates another, um, and it creates some vorticity behind it that is in fact swirling in the opposite direction to the one when it, in the first half of the cycle. And if we were at zero Reynolds numbers, so if we were in Stokes flow, of course, we wouldn't get these vortices, but the, the flow field from the second half of the cycle would, if we, if we were to take an average over the cycle, the, the field, um, the velocity field of the second half would cancel with the first half of the cycle. And on average, we would get uh, zero time average flow. Um, but here, we're not at zero Reynolds numbers. And so what happens is that these vortices persist and, um, and in fact, they are vortex rings. So alpha alpha prime is a vortex ring. I always think of it when I give talks, I have a slinky spring and I put it around the board. It's hard to do it here. Um, and beta beta prime is, a, is another vortex ring. So, there's, so this, is the, this arrow is the um, direction of the vibration, the oscillation. The sphere is moving up and down and it creates these two vortex rings around it that persist. They, they don't add up to zero. As a result, or maybe these things happen all together, uh, um, but uh, what, what happens is that you have a secondary vorticity uh, that you can see here, another two vortex rings, that uh, two outer vortex rings that are swirling in the opposite direction uh, to the inner ones, right? So they have to, to be the same direction here. So these are swaddling uh, clockwise, this is counterclockwise and so on. So the average flow field for a single oscillating sphere is very complicated, basically. This is already what I, one of the points that I would like to make. 
uh, the, the, the first point. Now what Riley says is that, and, and I would like to also point out that this is steady. So what was really interesting about this work, about Riley's work and uh, people who worked on this, is that, um, that we have this oscillation, um, but this field that you're seeing here is what comes out when you uh, take an average, right? So this is steady. And this is, uh, I thought that was very interesting. These two indicate stagnation points um, on the, um, of the field. So, the, so Riley uh, showed this and he also went beyond that and basically said that, okay, if we now look at, um, if we now still within this intermediate regime, but, uh, in the limit where the viscosity is increasing or the Reynolds number is going down, what happens is that these vortices, these inner vortices, they get, uh, they get bigger. Uh, spatial and the outer ones are weaker uh, and further out. And the limit that he studied, that he could study analytically, what he showed is that Basically, this is the this is the this is what happens when you when you're at uh, lower Reynolds numbers, still within within this intermediate regime, um, where the boundary this boundary layer essentially uh, vortices expand and and are open. So you have these two limits of behavior at high Reynolds and at lower Reynolds. Um, so the, this inner vortex expands here on the left. And you can imagine that now we have this second sphere that we add. So this is what is known analytically in the two limits. Now our system is a bit more complicated, not only that it has a second sphere, um, but also the, some of the assumptions are not quite the same as in the analytical work. But uh, what I would like to point out is now imagine that we put a second sphere. This is sort of our dumbbell situation. And notice how uh, if I look over here, um, a certain distance from the dumbbell, in this case, the field is pulling up, right? And in this case, what I see, what I would experience is a field pushing down. So you see there's this reversal of, um, of behavior, of fluid flow uh, away, a certain um, distance away from, from the sphere uh, and, and perhaps consequently uh, what we see for the, for the dumbbell. This is, uh, I'm just gonna show you quickly the images from Riley's paper. Um, so this is the sphere here in these two cases. And one of the assumptions that he has made is that we have a small amplitude compared to the radius. Remember this for a single oscillating sphere, it's not for a pair. And another parameter that is important is this oscillatory boundary layer thickness. So this is a um, uh, length scale. And he, the two limits that I, that he's, he solved analytically and that I, I presented before, uh, I, I just showed you are the limits where this uh, delta, this oscillatory boundary layer thickness is much larger than the radius. So this is the low Reynolds number uh, ish case. And then uh, where delta is much smaller than the radius of the sphere. And right, so you can see here, this is the, oops. This is the oscillation of the, of the sphere. And here the fluid is pulling up. Uh, this is the oscillation of the sphere and the fluid is pushing away. So this is the reversal of flows that uh, Riley showed for a single oscillating sphere. So what we think is that it is really due to the steady streaming reversal of flows that leads to um, what, you know, these inertial pullers and pushers, uh, these, this uh, reversal of, uh, of, the, of the fluid field. Um, the question remains, um, oh, one question I would like, before I talk about this, uh, what, I, what I would like to say is that the other question that I wanted to answer is what happens, why does, a, why does it switch direction? So the flow field changes direction, but why does the swimmer switch direction? And I think it's really interesting to think about this uh, dumbbell swimmer that we have and as a, um, almost as an organism where the small sphere is, is the appendage, right? So it's like the, fla the flagellum. So in one case, in the small sphere leading regime, the, the small sphere, even though the two swimmers are identical geometrically, 
and they could be identical in terms of their, you know, even frequencies and, and amplitudes. In one case, uh, because of the because of the fluid, the, the, the because of the fluid dynamics, the, the fluid is being pulled up. So the small sphere is pulling fluid up and moving down. In the other case, uh, so this acts like a puller, uh, and in the whereas in the other case. It acts like a tail of a bacterium, and it's sort of pushing fluid away, even though it's just doing exactly the same thing as in the other case. So we thought that was a really interesting kind of analogy uh, of a sort of um, theoretical system. And um, so, in the last few slides, I so so this is so there there are a lot of details that I I didn't. I, I didn't go into, and we have uh, this paper and also another paper that talks about the kinematics of, of, of this swimmer and this switch in behavior, and I'll be happy to talk more about this. But uh, for the last few minutes, I would like to discuss a little bit about active matter because that was the original motivation, and uh, I have always wanted to, to, to look at what, what happens with these animal swimmers. Um, uh, when, when we have a lot of them, when look at the collective behavior. So the first, uh, so just starting with a simple, like uh, one of our old uh, videos, just, you know, we're looking at pairs, like how do two uh, swimmers uh, interact? And this is a busy slide. I, I, I just want to point out that we have looked at a lot of, um, pairwise uh, interaction. So we have put pairs, starting them at different configurations, at different initial conditions, and we look at what happens. And the idea is, of course, to try and get an understanding of what happens for the pair in order to then also study what happens when you have more than, than two swimmers. And what I'm showing here is the stable configurations that we found uh, um, across uh, different Reynolds numbers and um, and different initial configurations. So I'm just going to take you through them very quickly. Just that there is this V shape that we see, and then the the combined object. You know, they 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 stay together and they move down. Um, also, this kind of configuration at the lower Reynolds numbers, they sort of like to align like this and move down. Um, we see, uh, we see this kind of configuration as well, uh, or a chain that looks like this. Uh, this phi is the, is the phase difference between the two swimmers, so we have done it at different uh, phases as well. So th there is a lot of stuff here, but I'm just gonna go ahead and show you some uh, videos where you, you will get a, a sort of more intuition about what is happening. This is all like pretty, um, new results and um, not published yet. So let me start again. So I have put these little uh, points here to indicate the initial position. This is where the center of mass of the large sphere is, but the, the point is just to show that uh, how, how far the swimmer has gone. So the first example is gonna be at the lower Reynolds number. So this is a small sphere leading uh, case. Um, this is what the average flow, fluid flow looks like for this. So remember, this is a, a, like an effective puller. So it would move down if it was on its own. The fluid is going up and out here. So, uh, and these points, yeah, they, they show um, the initial positions. And so you can see the, the vorticity as well as the, the, the velocity field. And you quickly see that they form this V shape and then they're moving kind of down diagonally, so in the direction of the small sphere. Now, if we do the same thing, but at higher Reynolds numbers, okay, so this is the, so this is the large sphere leading regime. So this on its own would be swimming up, right? And the flow is such that it comes in on the sides and it pushes away uh, along the, the axis of oscillation. And this is what happens. <clears throat> this is what happens at the higher Reynolds. So they they quickly um, adjust the, the 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 swimmers, and then they they sort of it's either a sort of slight V shape or kind of parallel to each other. Um, but what's interesting is that they have created an effective puller. So they're moving with a small sphere at the front. 
I don't know if it's an effective puller actually, but they're moving with a small sphere on the front. So the, the fluid flow um, details are, are very interesting for these pairs and this is what we are uh, in the process of, of doing. We also see uh, things like an orbiting pair. Uh, this uh, kind of makes sense. These things are, you know, they, they constantly, they, they want to, you know, they're swimmers. They, 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 it, it's very hard to uh, s stay in place. So then uh, in certain configurations, they just sort of keep swimming around each other. Um, and then I have some more examples. So this is a, this is just a, a, an example of an unstable pair at higher Reynolds. Uh, it's a little slow. I can speed it up. Yeah, so they're just moving away from one another, it seems. And we see that when we put um, um, more swimmers as well, that, that this happens. We, we actually don't see collection. Uh, finally, what we are doing is we want to look at, um, at what happens when we put more. And I'm just going to show you two examples here that already indicate that with this transition in, with this reversal of fluid flows, you can already see um, differences in terms of the collective behavior even beyond the, that is quite striking. Uh, beyond the pair as well. So in the one case here that I'm showing, this is at the lower Reynolds number and the fluid flow, remember such that it's along the axis of oscillation and out on the sides. So what we see is this kind of chains, like network kind of thing. And in fact, with more recent simulations, what we see is that this looks kind of um, stable in the sense that it doesn't uh, swim it doesn't um, it doesn't translate much whereas in contrast when we have uh, at higher Reynolds numbers the fluid flow is kind of the opposite so it's pushing away so it would be really hard to form this kind of network at the higher Reynolds numbers but we see that they they prefer to be side by side which also kind of makes sense although in fact more simulations show more complicated behavior. Um, and I'm going to finish very soon. This is some of the newer stuff that we're doing. So we're putting things in circular confinement. Uh, these are expensive simulations, but um, my group is working really hard to um, speed them up and do things as efficiently as possible. So, uh, so it will be interesting to actually see what happens with the collective behavior at those um, uh, intermediate Reynolds numbers. One uh, final point I, I would like to make is that we have this, um, this system of uh, brine shrimp. We have collaborators. So Kemal, I was supposed to put his picture here and I forgot, but uh, Kemal is Laura Miller's student and uh, he has been working with brine shrimp. So in, 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 in the, uh, to answer the question of how relevant this is for real organisms, what I would like to point out is to show these brine shrimps. So this is um, in slow motion. And what I would like to point out is how, these are very small brine shrimp. And what I would like you to notice is how much backward they go before they go forward. Um, so you see they, they right? Because the, the Reynolds number is quite small. It's intermediate, but it's small. And what I'm showing here is our model at these lower Reynolds numbers, which just shows you. So this is swimming down, um, translating down, but you see how much it sort of goes up before it translates down. And this was the, the idea uh, that I wanted to, to show here. So I'm just gonna finish because I don't think I have a lot of time. So, but we are doing like larger systems um, at various Reynolds numbers and I can show you a little more, but I'm just going to go into conclusions and some open questions. So what I would like to say is that we see uh, very rich behaviors from, from, from very simple reciprocal swimmer, essentially. Um, another a question that I would like to, to that I, I'm asking myself is whether steady streaming flows may be relevant for biological or artificial swimmers at these intermediate Reynolds numbers. So this idea that you have uh, that when you have a rigid body uh, oscillating in a flow at intermediate Reynolds number, it creates a steady, a, a part of the flow that's steady. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that biological swimmers 
that would be the dominant reason where they swim, but it could be something that they utilize, <clears throat> whether it is for swimming or for other uh, functions. So could steady streaming flows be utilized by biological swimmers? Now the question is, what, ha what about other models? The original, my original um, uh, goal was to study a lot of different swimmers. And then we found that even this like, very simple one has this richness in behavior and, and is also quite challenging to, to model. Um, so, um, but it would be really interesting to look at other models and try to make some general guidelines or some general um, principles. Uh, transitions are, are really interesting, both in the individual uh, swimmer case, but also for, um, for the collective behavior. And again, like this final point of like as swarms and aggregates increase in size, think about inertia and where it kicks in. So I'm just going to end with this slide that shows uh, this perspective paper that I talked about in the beginning and these two papers that are uh, from my group since I got here that are uh, talking about this uh, self-propelled swimming. This is a paper uh, with the experiments uh, that I showed in the beginning. And I would like to thank my funding and you can check everything at my website as well. So thank you very much.